I was not recording. So let me just, just uh, reintroduce Dr. Kalika Sachin for uh, this webinar. And you're gonna give a presentation on the six systems of Hindu philosophy, the Shardashanas, and um, take it away. Namaste everybody. And thank you, Ankurji, for that wonderful um, introduction. And I'm absolutely excited to talk with you all um, about the six darshanas from Hindu philosophy. Uh, just to introduce myself uh, very briefly from a different perspective, as a student of philosophy, I often call myself as a student of uh, philosophy because that is supposed to be the goal of human life according to Indian philosophy or Hindu philosophy to be precise. So when we talk about Shad Darshanas, uh, I see there is a lot of interest amongst people to understand, and this is really uh, making me so happy. And uh, the first question which comes into mind is, why philosophy? And uh, the very important uh, answer to this can be, uh, and which has been the answer throughout uh, countries and throughout cultures and civilizations and religion is after we fulfill our daily uh, desires and achievements, and there is a point in life where we feel that, is this all? I mean, is this the reason why I was born? I mean, is this the goal of my life? What can be the real achievement in life? So the initial years in life, we struggle a lot to achieve the so-called achievements uh, those are told to us right from the schooling days uh, to the time we get married, we have kids and then the kids go ahead and they try to complete the same cycle. But then there is a point in life uh, that doesn't restrict us to any age. But if a person is thinking about life seriously and is very curious and is very inquisitive about the reason behind everything that is happening, and is always trying to find out a cause behind an effect, then it becomes very natural that we try to find out answers to the questions like, who am I? Why am I here? And what is the goal of my life? What is the real achievement? Otherwise, uh, Shankara Chariji says that punarapi janmam punarapi maranam Again and again, uh, we take birth, again and again we die, we sleep in the womb of the mother and again we take birth. It's like the grass which grows on the highlands, it just grows to a certain length and then it withers away. Is our life so, I mean, so mundane or is there any purpose? Are we globally just puppets of what is happening or do we have a choice? Do we have a control over our life? Can we decide to know the reality? I mean, with this kind of mindset, a person starts thinking about philosophy. And here comes the question in mind that when we are talking about Shat Darshanas, what does this word Darshana mean? Is this similar to the word philosophy as we understand today? Or does it have a different meaning to it? Does it have a different, uh, slight different shade to what it tries to tell us? And that is the uh, point from where we can enter into the realm of Shad Darshana or the six systems of Hindu philosophy. Now this course is about six systems of Hindu philosophy, but we will also be taking care of the three systems which are called as Charua, Jainism and Buddhism. Later on, I'll come to the detailed uh, understanding of the bifurcation of uh, Astik and Nastik Darshanas. But initially to talk about the word Darshana, the word Darshan comes from the word Drusha, to see, to perceive, to observe, to understand. So this is a word which needs to be understood from different levels. At the primary level, to see is just perception. Seeing that the cat is standing on the mat is a simple perception. But then later on, as we go, we try to infer about the fact that we are seeing and then comes in logic, then comes in 
inference. So this is how we try to understand the word. Then somebody comes and tells us that, well, across the road, there is a new uh, shop that has opened. And we believe, we say, oh, yes. Now that is testimony, that is shabda. That is we take the authority of somebody and we believe in what they are saying. So these are different sources of knowledge. So this is one activity that we try to keep doing. So when we talk about darshana, perception, seeing, it is seeing the truth as it is. It is experience, but the experience has different levels. So while studying Shaddarshanas, we will try to understand how each system of philosophy understands this perception, how each system of Indian philosophy talks about understanding the truth, understanding the reality. Uh, unfortunately, being Indians, many times, you know, we just are misled by the so-called uh, religion and the so-called ritualism that is happening around us. And uh, sorry to say, but mindlessly, generations after generations, people keep doing the rituals. But rarely someone dares to ask the real meaning of it. And what is the philosophy behind it? So why is Indian philosophy different from other philosophies? Why is Indian culture different from other cultures? So the basis of Indian culture, I would say, is Indian philosophy. And this is an opportunity to understand what is Indian philosophy in gist? What is the essence of Indian philosophy, which has made a strong impact on the culture and the civilization for thousands of years? And what is that strength, which has made it sustain its existence even today? And that is something which we will try to find out when we are studying about the Shad Darshanas. So darshan is understanding the reality. Now the second question is, is this similar to philosophy as we understand when we talk about modern philosophy or generally when we talk about philosophy? Let us try to see that philosophy comes from the word philologus. That is love for reason, love for knowledge. So that's also a quest for knowledge. But mostly, uh, if you see the Western philosophy and the whole process of Western philosophy, uh, it is a whole uh, process of understanding the reality, but the perception of reality is more of an intellectual pursuit. And to that level, even Indian philosophy or darshanas would be similar to what is Western philosophy because these are different attempts to understand philosophy from different levels of understanding. Now, what makes darshan different from philosophy is that it also talks about experiencing the truth. It talks about experiencing the reality, not just sticking to the inference logic or testimony, but beyond that, there can be an experience of eternality. There can be an experience of truth and which can help us to eradicate what we say as suffering or dukkha. So Buddhism talks about dukkha. Upanishads talk about dukkha, that is sorrow. And uh, the answer to this is somewhat what we say is pursuit of knowledge. As you all know, even Socrates said that, or Plato said that knowledge is virtue. Why knowledge is virtue? Because even the Western philosophy believes that to understand something, as it is, should be the goal of life. Coming to Darshana, they also believe that understanding reality, understanding the eternality is the goal of my life. And let me find out what is the real means to find out knowledge, what is the real means to understand the reality. So Darshanas take a leap further wherein they also talk about experiencing the truth. Because a simple criteria of truth is, if something is truth, it has to be at in all times. It has to be at all places. And if it is outside, it has to be inside also, within me. Now, this is an interesting characteristic of Indian philosophy, where the quest goes within. 
within ourselves. It's an inward movement to find what lies within me. So if something is there outside me and if that is truth, it has to be within me also. And if I have to experience it outside, I should be able to experience it within me. So let me go and find out. Let me go into the search. And how can we find out which is the proper search? Well, then these are different perspectives that those are Shad Darshanas. So we will be studying about uh, these Shad Darshanas. Now, the second question which automatically follows from this is that all the six darshanas, are they contradictory to each other? Or do they, um, are they just, you know, hierarchical systems that one follows after the other? Or uh, do they sit in a timeline that one system was uh, initially, it, it came up, it evolved, and the second system evolved from it, and the third system, so is there a sequential relation between them? This can be a question in our mind. Now, coming to this question, uh, I would like to share that all these thoughts are found in the Vedas and the Upanishads. They are spread in different um, chapters and dialogues and stories. And these are different perspectives. But later on, uh, Historically, we are not aware about a civilization. We don't have that many historical um, connections now to really understand what was the timeline and when this happened. But for sure, it gives us an understanding that there was a civilization, there was a society where knowledge was considered to be of utmost importance and that there were scholarly things happening in all fields of life. So all these thoughts, those are found in the Upanishads. There were different scholars who picked up something which was close to their intellectual temperament and their emotional temperament. And they worked on it. And then from there developed different philosophical systems. So they basically are not um, contradicting each other, but these are different perspective. So you know, we can take an example of an mountain like if when, when a small boy starts climbing a mountain and he comes to a particular height and he looks down and he sees something he says wow the world looks like this from in height then he climbs a little further and then he sees a broader picture and when we reach at the top of the mountain we see a different picture similarly there is a very interesting analogy of an elephant which we see in the Syadwar in Jainism which talks about the elephant now, someone sees the tail of the elephant and says, oh, truth is like this. The elephant is like a tail. Someone go, they are blind people, okay? So they are trying to understand elephant by just, you know, touching him. So someone goes and touches the um, leg of the elephant and says, oh, elephant is like a pole, big, strong pole. Somebody goes and touches, uh, somehow manages to touch a little part of the stomach of the elephant and he says, oh, he's climbing mostly maybe by the ladder. So he says, oh, this is like a wall. Elephant is like a wall. So these are different perceptions, perspectives of one single elephant. Similarly, different systems of philosophy try to understand reality from their perspective. So they are basically not contradicting each other, but they are telling a part of the truth. And later on, when we complete the study of six darshanas, it is very interesting, which we would be trying to uh, which we will try to understand in the last uh, week of our course as how we can uh, put this puzzle together and can we find some harmony between them? Can we find some interesting links between them? That would really be interesting. So in that sense, I would say these systems, they are not contradictory. In fact, uh, there is a very healthy discussion going on amongst the scholars. And the main characteristic of the six darshanas is that uh, they are all so open-minded. They are undogmatic and they don't want to destroy each other. They respect each other. And believe me, friends, isn't this so nice? Something that is different from what I feel, something that is different from what I think need not be necessarily bad or wrong. It can be there. I can still respect 
I can still accept it and still have my own thought. This is such a sophisticated concept of living. And this existed. And out of this came the six schools of Indian philosophy. Gradually, as we move ahead, we will see how even Charuaks were respected, uh, who talked about materialism, Nayaikas were respected, Vaishishikas were respected. So this is an openness and freedom of knowledge. This is a common characteristic. Now, another thing which this, all these schools share uh, is about um, very basic question of human life, and that is, how do I end my sorrow? How do I end my suffering? Because every single person in this world will experience suffering. Because uh, that is, I, I feel that that is an opportunity to grow. That is an opportunity to seek. That is an opportunity to not get stuck up with what I'm enjoying, but try to figure out that maybe there is something beyond this. Maybe there is a reality behind this. Maybe what I'm experiencing, maybe what I'm understanding is very limited. And let me go beyond this. So this human urge to go beyond what I'm experiencing now is this quest. And this is shared by all six darshanas or all six systems of Indian philosophy. So this is one very important characteristic. Third important characteristic is that all the six darshanas, or in that case, even the uh, Jainism, Buddhism, and Charvaks also, they believe in the ethics and the ethical um, responsibility that we all share. So they say that unless and until we are ethically disciplined, uh, no possibility of any knowledge is possible. I mean, so to gain knowledge, there has to be a minimal level of discipline and morality to be practiced because uh, that gives us a capacity to go beyond what we are living. The moment there is no discipline, the moment there is no morality, uh, it is all that we are just you know, getting more and more involved in the world that we are perceiving through our five sense organs. But if we have to go beyond that, we will see it in Yoga Darshana while we were studying at how discipline actually brings in a lot of happiness and peace. And what is the real meaning of discipline? That we will see in Yoga Darshan. And that is such a beautiful Darshan. And we would see that how uh, it is a totally a different way of perceiving life and ourselves. And how it is not just restricted to few asanas, few postures, or little bit of breathing exercises. No, it is much more than that. And we would go into depth to understand what really yoga darshan means. We talk about modern science and modern science talks about atoms, subatomic particles. And it is so interesting to see that the Vaisheshik darshan also talk about atomism. What are atoms? Parmanu is the concept which comes in Vaisheshik. They talk about the Padartha theory. So there we will see in deep how that kind of naturalism corresponds with the modern science that we are studying and how those people through what type of understanding came to these conclusions and how they knew about it. So that is an interesting thing. Mimamsa Darshan is also of the same. So coming to back to the point, we're saying that all this Darshanas, they coexisted and they had scholarly discussions with each other, but they were very rigorous. Intellectually, they were very rigorous and each system had to prove that their perception is right from the logical point of view. This helped each system to be logically rigorous and to grow. So at the same time, it is open, it is undogmatic. At the same time, it follows the rigor of logic and higher logic. And we will see that how they can do that. And gradually, it's a journey to find out what can be the ultimate reality of life. So that is one important characteristic. Another important characteristic in all the Shad Darshanas is it, is it believes in the law of karma, that every action has a reaction. So whatever we do, it will have a reaction. And what kind of reactions it will have? How will it impact our life? We will see 
this question also and how each school is talking about this. So uh, this would be really interesting to understand. And then we would come to the third question, which is very uh, interesting is that, um, Yes, I think we covered this point, which says that they coherently exist together and they interact with each other. And it becomes very interesting to understand. Now I would like to give a brief overview of all the six darshanas. So I will uh, take help of few slides. So just give me a moment, I'll share the screen with you. Let me just give me a moment. Sorry, friends, there's something technically is going wrong. Why don't you stop sharing and then try and focus in on the PowerPoint? Yeah. Yes, it's there. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah. Let's go to full screen. Yes. There we go. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Yes. Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, so we coming here to understanding and having a brief understanding of what are Shad Darshanas. Uh, they are divided into two segments. The first is Astika and the another is Nastika. So Astik basically means that uh, they believe in the authority of the Vedas. And Nastik Darshanas, they believe, they don't believe in the authority of the Vedas. So they are, so basically believers and non-believers. So believers in Veda and non-believers in Veda, this is how the systems get divided. Later on, we will see how, even though they, how they have so many things in common and uh, they appear to be different, but it is such an interesting journey that every concept when we are dealing, uh, we find that there is some connection with the other system. There is an interesting connection with the uh, cultural impact it is having even today. And that makes it interesting. So coming to the Asti Darshan, the first Darshan is Nyaya, then it is Vaisheshik, Sankhya, Yoga, Mimamsa and Vedanta. And when it comes to Nastik Darshan, it is Charvak, Jainism and Buddhism. Now, Charvak is also called as uh, Lokayat Darshan, that is Darshan of the people. And I really enjoy talking about this Darshan and we will, uh, I think even you will enjoy it because I feel that is one Darshan which we are meticulously following even today. So let us try to understand how that is so relevantly being followed even today. And why at that time, people just accepted it as a school of philosophy. Isn't it an example of being so open and undogmatic? So we would come back to that as we start with our course. 
Now coming to the Nyaya uh, school of philosophy, the founder is Rishi Gautama. And there are 528 sutras. Now what is a sutra? Sutra is basically an aphorism, uh, wherein we talk about something in a gist. Like E is equal to MC square is a sutra. Similarly, most of the Sanskrit literature comes in this form. The main characteristic of sutra is that uh, it has to have very few words. In a very few words, they have to talk more. They have to give more reasons. The second character of a sutra is that it should be a sindhikta. That is, there shouldn't be any doubt. There shouldn't be any confusion. It shouldn't be clumsy. It should be exact, precise, and clear. Thirdly, it has to have its essence. Sometimes what happens is uh, when we talk about something, uh, there is a possibility that we use a lot of jargons, we use a lot of uh, flowery language, uh, we give so many examples, but the essence is not there. So they say stick to the essence. So the rigor is there. Similarly, these sutras has to be sarvato mukha. That is, it has to be, uh, it has to have a capacity to relate to different problems and life and it has to be relatable to be precise. So these sutras are 528 in the Nyaya Darshan. Nyaya Darshan also believes that suffering in human life is because of ignorance. But their concept of removing this ignorance is by getting knowledge. A knowledge of what? That makes it different from the Sankhya Darshan. That makes it different from the Vedanta Darshan. So for them, inference is the major source of knowledge. So we would be studying the epistemology of Indian philosophy, which is basically the theories of knowledge, where we'll be talking about what is knowledge, what are the sources of knowledge, and how do we achieve this knowledge, and what happens after we achieve this knowledge. So there are six, I would say nine different theories of epistemology that we would be dealing. We would be dealing about the metaphysics of Indian philosophy, which talks about what is reality, uh, what is existence, and how it is to be understood. So basically, when we talk about Nyaya Darshana, they give utmost importance to logic. For them, logic is very important. And the whole of Nyaya Darshan later on gets developed into Navya Nyaya also. And it is hardcore higher logic that uh, we study. And it is very rigorous. Uh, but uh, just for your sake, I would say uh, it is also very interesting. It is also very challenging. And it shows that there was a civilization where people were very academically, rigorously um, doing certain activities uh, where they wanted to find what is truth, what is reality. It is not always that Hinduism is superficial or it is believing in wrong norms. I mean, whatever misnorms, those are connected with Hinduism those can be removed while we study Nyaya and we really understand that. Um, the next darshan is Vaisheshik darshan. Vaisheshik is about uh, talking about the atoms or the Parmanu. It has the Padartha theory, which talks about different categories and uh, their qualities and how this world is divided into different categories so basically, they believe that all of this world has come together with the permutation and combination of atoms. So we also talk about subatomic particles and atoms and uh, everything. So even there are concepts similar to that, which we would find while we are studying Vaisheshik. Normally, Nyaya and Vaisheshik, they share similar metaphysics. So they are clubbed together. So Nyaya Vaisheshik is a term usually. But we would study it uh, separately also. It consists of 374 sutras. And the founder is Rushi Kanat. Uh, Kana is atom. So he was named Kanat because he came up with this theory. And this system believes in the concept of God as an intelligent being. So this is an uh, ultimate intelligence, which we can say which is God and which... Um, 
through its intelligence has created the brahma brahma has created this world and these are all permutation and combinations of this padartha or parmanu this is what vaisheshik believes we'll go it into the detail as we get into the course of course and after this comes the darshan which is called as sankhya darshan sankhya is basically sankhya numer num number so this basically has 526 sutras sankhya karika is the main commentary written by ishwar krishna but the original sutras are missing but we see them into different other literature and collecting them together ishwar krishna has written a uh, commentary which is profound and which is uh, very nicely written and so that is the main literature which is available for us to study now sankhya basically talks about the two concepts this whole world consists of purusha and prakruti so purusha is the omniscient omnipotent individually it exist prakruti is also similarly important it also exist prakruti is sattva raja and tamo that is it has these three types of uh, characteristics sattvik rajasa and tamasa these are different um, they won't say category but these are the attributes of prakruti and how there is a combination and permutation of this out of which the world is created so and there are many purushas there is not one purusha so purusha and prakruti are the two elements which exist in the world this is what the sankhyas believe and uh, they share this metaphysics is shared by the uh, darshan which we say as yoga but yoga is basically understood as sadhana as practice so whatever intellectually and uh, philosophically is understood it has to be implemented in life this is the characteristic of indian philosophy hindu religion uh, sanatan dharma hindu philosophy this is the main main point that whatever we say has to be implemented in our behavior whatever we believe in should be the directing principle of our life that should help us to decide the goal of our life so intellectual um thoughts are not just any other activity but they has to they have to be aligned with our goal of life which we see in the darshan of yoga yoga basically has 196 sutras uh, the origin of yoga is not from patanjali yoga sutras we see yoga sutras in upanishads brudharanyaka upanishad chandokya itareya shvetashwar upanishads all of these upanishads have sutras from yoga bhagavad gita has lot of uh, uh, as you all know has lot of uh, discussion about yoga but patanjali rushi has uh, consolidated it into 196 sutras and very scholarly and intellectually profoundly he has come up with this aphorisms uh, which has given a structure to this darshana which is yoga darshana and this basically is eight fold darshan wherein यम नियम आसन प्राणायाम प्रत्याहार धारणा ध्यान समाधि दीज आर द एट फोल्ड इज द एट फोल्ड पाथ ऑफ योगा व्हिच टेक्स अस टुवर्ड्स मोक्ष मोक्ष इज लिबरेशन सो लिबरेशन इज रिमूवल ऑफ दुख रिमूवल ऑफ सफरिंग अ स्टेट ऑफ पीस वी विल सी हाउ इट इज इट्स वेरी ब्यूटीफुली पुट इनटू दिस दे आल्सो बिलीव इन द कांसेप्ट ऑफ ईश्वर their concept of ishwar is also very interesting uh, there is one sutra in yoga sutra which says guru nam guru that is teacher of the teacher guru of the guru who is this so sankhyas will say it is the purusha vedantas will say it is the brahman so we will get into that discussion as we go through it uh, in future but that is also very interesting and after yoga darshan comes the mimamsa darshan the founder of mimamsa darshan is rishi jaimini mimamsa sutra consists of 2500 sutras they believe that this world is real unlike the vedantas uh, the mimamsa kas will not say that this is unreal they say this whole world is real and it is governed by the law of karma that is basically the rituals that you perform so this is little 
um, they think that you know for performing the rituals uh, you can reach to the heaven and then enjoy the benefits of your good rituals so they basically are one uh, kind of thought and uh, philosophy which we find it in vedas atharva veda rug veda we will find the remnants things but jaimini was the rishi who consolidated and has come up with these sutras it's also very interesting to study mimamsa and uh, some of the scholars see that the roots of vedanta are found in mimamsa the roots of vedanta are found in sankhya nyaya so these connections we will as and as we go ahead we will uh, try to understand this and then comes the sixth darshan which is called as vedanta or uttar mimamsa uh, vedanta is anta is the end ved which comes after the ved uh, this is like uh, whatever is taught in the vedas what is the essence of vedas that is in the upanishads so the three main sources of vedanta is upanishad brahma sutra and bhagavad gita they are also called as prasthanatrayi these are the three elements which will take you towards moksha prasthan is taking you moving ahead so upanishads brahma sutra and bhagavad gita together if we study uh, it helps us to reach moksha that is the concept here now the rishi badrayana has written brahma sutras they are absolutely rigorous sutras aphorisms which talk about vedanta and uh, three main acharyas have written commentaries on brahma sutra and they are shankaracharya for advait vedanta ramanujacharya for vishishta advait and madhvacharya for dvaitavad so and still there are more schools uh, of vedanta philosophy shaivism is there i mean there are many of them in kerala they practice it differently kashmir it is different uh, then madhvacharya also came up with dvait dvaitavad how that is related to vedanta which is a very interesting study so the main uh, uh, concept that we see in vedanta is brahman that is the ultimate reality what is the nature of brahman what is the nature of ultimate reality uh, and who am i am i the jiva then what is my relation with that ultimate reality and am i different from the ultimate reality or do i have some connection if i have what is the connection and then what is this world about what is the nature of the world that is the jagat so uh, understanding these concepts and their uh, interconnections basically uh, is about vedanta so these are all basically the astic schools of uh, indian philosophy hindu philosophy now let me just have an brief introduction about the other part of the that is the heterodox schools which are called as nastic schools they are charuak uh, buddhism and jainism so charuak basically they talk about materialism uh, they say that the world that we see is only real there is nothing beyond this there is no heaven there is no brahman nothing beyond what i am seeing so just be lawful just be moral and stick to this life and be good so morality for them is a social system which needs to be followed by everybody and uh, it is very interesting but what has happened is in the some scholars have uh, deviated uh, from the real meaning of charuak and they have uh, changed the meaning into saying that they say that you can live i mean without any discipline whichever way you want that is a misleading interpretation of charuak but we will see that as we get into that uh, jainism basically i like uh, jain darshan uh, for its syadavad which talks about uh, possibility it's a theory of possibility uh, those of you who are into science and classical science uh, we will have discussion then Uh, how the theory of possibility in science and let us see what jainism talks about it the simple meaning is that there are different perspectives to truth and it can be understood so syad asti syad nasti this is possible this is also possible this is not possible so there are different permutations and combinations of that so we will see that buddhism of course it talks about higher morality it shares the same concept of yoga where it talks about ahimsa 
Satya, Asteya, Brahmasharya, that is the absolute five main cardinal virtues of uh, yoga that we see. And uh, it also has its own uh, metaphysics and epistemology also. So it would be an interesting journey to find out how the schools are uh, different. Just let me get out of this uh, slides and I'll come back to start. One second. Yes. So after we have had a, a brief um, understanding of um, the six systems, the last but the important point which comes into the mind is, uh, why should I study Shad Darshan? At the end of the course, what is my takeaway? What will I get out of this course? Is the last question which uh, is actually very important. And also, how is this course structured? What is the structure of this course? So this course will be conducted for 11 weeks and we will be having lectures every week on Friday evening. And uh, each darshana, that is the nine darshanas, six astic darshanas and the three nastic darshanas will take the nine weeks uh, the initial week will be uh, about the introduction of all the darshans and their corresponding, um, I mean, their relation with the corresponding concepts. That will be the beginning. At the end, on the 11th week, uh, there will be a question answer session. Plus, the, com the course will end with you writing one essay. Now, that will be the assessment for this course. So out of this nine darshans, uh, which one is closer to you intellectually, emotionally, which one you have liked, which you would like to dwell into more, you will have to pick up one and go into it at a deeper level and try to write an essay of uh, maybe thousand words or so. So that would be your final assessment. So based on your interactions during the course and this essay, uh, there will be an assessment. Now coming to the end part of it is that, uh, what is my takeaway? So one takeaway is that we will understand what is the real philosophical background of the life that we have been living so far. If we call ourselves as Hindus, do I really know what is Hindu philosophy? Mostly, we know little about Vedanta. We know that Hindu religion talks about moksha, Hindu religion talks about rituals, Hindu religion talks about different, different things. But we need to understand all the segments and then interconnect them and try to find a harmonious balance between these different uh, aspects of our living and find out that Hinduism is not about confusion. Hinduism is not about chaos. Hinduism is about a proper harmony and open-mindedness to the philosophical discussion about the reality. And this openness is not the weakness, but it is the strength of a civilization because of which it has sustained. And how it has happened, we will look into that. That will be your takeaway. Secondly, uh, you will be uh, well prepared uh, to take your next step and go deep into one of the darshan if you are interested. If you want to study Vedanta, if you want to study Sankhya, then this is a preparation for that. Uh, earlier, people used to go to Kashi and study each darshan for 12 years. And how rigorous that was. And uh, how, I mean, that doesn't mean they only studied Nyaya. It, that doesn't mean they only studied Sankhya. They had to study all the darshans, but they had to focus on one darshan and go deep into that. So that kind of a study uh, is, was also possible. But uh, for us, this course will give an introduction to what Shad darshans are and it will equip us to go uh, further into our search for knowledge. That is one thing. And another important takeaway from the Shad darshan study uh, will be that uh, philosophically, 
our journey uh, will begin not just based on what someone is saying, but you will be equipped to understand uh, what it really uh, makes us understand how is knowledge, how it has to be understood, what are the criteria of knowledge, and what is the um, that slight line between the real knowledge and the superficial knowledge. So these are different levels of understanding which uh, we will develop. It will bring a lot of happiness and it will be very enriching, I feel. Uh, myself being a student of philosophy and student of Indian philosophy has given me immense happiness throughout my life. And with all the good and bad experiences that we all go through in life, I felt that uh, uh, this study of Indian philosophy has kept me happy and uh, has always given me the feeling of fulfillment and uh, peace, actually. So welcome you all to this journey of studying Indian philosophy, uh, six darshans. And uh, I think uh, we can be open for a chat or questions, if any, now. Yeah, there's uh, people have found the Q&A box. Thank you for putting questions there. Some people are putting them in the chat. Uh, please put them in the Q&A box. But per class, um, and it's going to be an HUA class, so you're going to be on the learning management system, the Zoom link, and you're going to be in a weekly meeting um, during this class time that does happen to overlap with other HUA courses. I was just checking, yes. And um, this is one of these courses that, Thank you for being interested in it. And we will plug you in week by week uh, through the HUA learning management system. And if uh, Kalikaji, if you have like readings or links or, or whatever it is that you want people to do, they'll have access to it and you can walk through it in your, in your class time. We do have some questions also, but if you want to respond to that, I know you already touched on the essay, maybe a thousand words at the end of the uh, quarter on a quarter system. And, and so we'll... Okay. If you want to elaborate on that. Sure. Thank you, Ankuji. Um, well, uh, for this course, I would be uh, giving readings and a textbook for Indian philosophy. I would send in the links. Uh, and also, uh, every week you will have to go through this reading. This won't be much, not more than 20, 25 pages. Uh, you will have to go through it, so you'll be prepared. And that would help us to get into question answers also. So that would be interesting. So in the course, I would take a few minutes, like around maybe 40 minutes or 45 minutes to talk and give an information. Then we would be open for discussion and different questions and answers we will tackle regarding that topic. And that would make it really interesting. So discussion-oriented course is something which I aim towards. And uh, I would try to answer more as much as possible. If not, I will take some time from you and I'll come prepared next time. So it's co-learning, that is what I believe. Um, we will be learning from each other. Uh, and that way we would be following the Upanishadic style of uh, studying. That is uh, virtually we are sitting together and trying to find answers to our philosophical questions. So that is would be the pattern. Well, uh, we can take a few questions, Ankuji. I think I'm lagging a little bit. I don't know if you want to see the box. I'm having. Oh, there he is. Um, oh. So, I, I, you know, you use the terminology kind of believers and non believers. Um, Ram Lakshmi Narayanji is saying that it seems like an Abrahamic uh, kind of connotation. Is that a correct description of Astika and Astika? One second. Can I read the question if it is like? Can yeah, you... it's in the Q and A. It's number two, Ram Lakshmi, and he phrases it: uh, believers and non-believers seem a lot Abrahamic. Uh, <laughs> is that a correct description of Astika and Nastika? Right, the Vedas are there's a lot of it, and you talked about it. Okay. Um, and no, some... no, sorry, uh, uh, I didn't mean that. Uh, it's not. Uh... Abrahamic and non-Abrahamic kind of uh, uh, distinction. I just uh, made a simple uh, statement saying that people who believe in Vedas are called Astika and people who don't believe in Vedas are called Nastika. 
Nevertheless, all these Astik and Nastik Darshanas, as we discussed, share few common points wherein everybody is trying to find out an answer to the suffering. Everybody is trying to find out what is the reality which lies beyond my experience. And whatever I am experiencing, is it truth or is truth also something beyond my experience? So they share several common points between them. So for that reason, I would not say that they are like Abrahamic or non-Abrahamic uh, distinction. Great. Uh, Godanji says, I think philosophy is very important to history. Why is it not taught more in schools and colleges all over the world, especially India, uh, where it could probably some of the earliest philosophical thoughts were developed, some of the historical stuff you alluded to. And that's what Hindu University of America is about. So please do consider enrolling in this introduction, introductory course. You know, we have the orientation to Hindu studies course, but different people have different paths to get into this knowledge. And so that's what Hindu University of America is doing, offering these platforms. And I'm also glad to say we're offering a discount. This course is accessible for only $200 and you're getting everything, um, all that access and that real time interest and all that. So I'm putting that link in the chat again. So please click and take a look at that. Uh, what level of uh, course will, and I think a lot of people are thinking is, are you going to go into each of the Dishanas, right? It's it's a one hour kind of, like you're saying, 45 minutes and then a little conversation, but just broadly, at what level are you going to try and get into each of the Dishanas? And then will there be a detailed study of each of these? Uh, Ramki Krishnanji is asking that. Okay. Um it won't be a meticulous study, but it will be uh, on the introductory level, but not very superficial. Because when we study about Nyaya, uh, we will go into the depth of understanding its metaphysical concepts, its ontological concepts, epistemological, moral, uh, its concept about the God. So for sure, you will get an exact idea about what the Darshan says. Now, if we have to go into deeper, like for why we are studying Sankhya Darshan, the deeper study uh, says that you have to go into the Sankha Karika study. Sankha Karika is uh, a commentary written by Ishwar Krishna on Sankhya. So then that is a different course altogether, which we would later on try to come up with, wherein every uh, uh, sutra of Sankhya is studied in depth. So that is a deeper study. Of course, we won't have time to go that deep. But you will have an idea about each darshan and its different theories and their interconnections. Yeah. Yes, there's so many different opportunities and paths. But again, this is an introductory course. Somebody is asking, we should have courses in Sanskrit. Yes, we have a whole series of Sanskrit courses. We have uh, even the Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit at HUA. But uh, there's different levels that you can plug into. So this one and the timing if it works for you it's starting january 14th it's going to be every friday i know it's 9 p.m eastern time but if you're in mauritius or I, I think in the caribbean or in different parts of the world the time may work for you so hopefully it does um we'll you'll get an email follow-up if you registered and you're a part of this webinar right now you'll get an email and we can ask uh, Kalika Ji to include any links or I don't know if we're going to you're going to share your PDF presentation Jiggle uh, Malpani Ji is asking that but maybe we'll include some links that you can go to but we'll follow up with a recording of this webinar as well um, an anonymous attendee is uh, kind of asking are you just born to follow in one or do you adopt by learning that's kind of a uh, just a question if you want to take that. And then Rajendra Paul is asking, why only six or nine darshanas? Why not more or less? Or is this inquiry into eternal truth complete and done? What is the foundation needed to create a new darshana? Is, is that possible? <laughs> the foundation Rajendra Paul is a friend who always has these thought-provoking questions. Okay. So the of course, we can found a new darshan. That's not a problem. But initially, uh, we will be studying this nine darshanas because there is a structure to that wherein uh, Nyaya Darshan talks about inference. Vaisheshik talks about naturalism, materialism. Uh, Yoga Darshan talks about practicability. That is sadhana part of it. And Vedanta Darshan talks about the goal of life in a different way. So these are different possible perspectives. But yes, yeah, I mean, this is an ongoing process of knowledge. So if someone comes up with another darshan, it's most welcome. But this has, as a uh, structure of studying Indian philosophy, uh, this has been formulated. 
and the nine darshan uh, when we when we say nine darshan those three darshanas which are heterodox the openness is uh, so nice that uh, st that's studying charuva jainism and buddhism enriches us to understand vedanta in a better sense it helps us to study nayikas also in a nyaya shastra also in a better sense so all these systems are interrelated on the level of thought and intellectual pursuit so they they have been combined together as a study so this is an initiation uh, but the quest in philosophy never ends and we are still open yeah uh, alan desai follows up with does this mean all jains are gnostic since it belongs to nastika and i think it's like we don't speak for everyone right everyone has their own nuances and the way that they define and so you're just giving this outline in this webinar not to speak too precisely and um if you want to jump on that one and um before we go into some more questions about the course sorry uh the voice was breaking on my side can you please repeat the question well if you want to take alan desai's question on the our jains gnostic since it belongs to gnostic and um okay uh well uh, let me tell one tell you one thing when we say gnostic it doesn't have any negative connotation so jainisms are called gnostic for a very simple reason that they don't believe in the authority of the vedas it is not about uh the na normal connotation that floats around which says that the believer in god are astic and believer in not believe non believers in god are gnostic no that's not the meaning which is to be understood in this context here it is just that whether you accept the authority of the veda or you reject the authority of the veda it's just that so from that standpoint yes jainism is considered as a gnostic but it doesn't have any negative connotation to that Right, right. Um, and Mikhail is asking, will this course be offered in the spring? We'll take it up based on this. We're trying to get enrollment for the winter quarter right now, so please do consider enrolling. I know th the other question, Nina uh, Narmanchiji, our friend, I ask is, is it possible to change this timing? Let me open up a poll right now. So we before we still have about 120 people in. If you can fill out this poll, let us know if you're interested in taking this course. Um, and maybe I have questions, right? If you have any, maybe a timing thing is really an issue. I don't know, Kalgaji, um, if that's up for consideration, if it's flexible, that time slot, depending. But if people are just interested, just let us know yes, no, maybe. And we'll do the follow up and see if it works out one way or another. Uh, if you want to speak to that at all, you're welcome to. Yeah, I mean, let's go to the poll and then we can take a call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll show, I'll show the results. So please fill it out. We have 44 out of. 124 people that's about 35 percent have filled it out if you can't see it just like minimize undo you know the technical issues we had some of those earlier just uh try and fill out the poll and let us know where you're at and we can go into some more questions were you able to pull up the q a box yourself yeah yeah so i um you know sometimes you moderate the questions you want to answer it could go uh, let me take these course ones and help clean up the q a box mm -hmm. um yeah, Michaela, we'll, we'll see what we can do about that. But 60 people have filled it out. Okay. Um, and the course will be in English primarily, correct? Mm -hmm. There is one question by Savitri Devaraj. Uh, Astikas accept Buddhism and Buddha as an avatar of Vishnu. How is that if Buddhism is atheistic? Uh, again, the same answer. Uh, initially, Buddhism... Uh, came up as a different uh, thought of philosophy because it did not accept Vedas. See, basically, Vedas consist of a lot of rituals also. And there was a so social uh, thought wherein some people did not believe in those rituals. And that was the reason that they decided not to accept Vedas as an authority. So they had to come up with a different metaphysics of their own. Different epistemology, though they share some common things. But being open, as in civilization, Buddhism was not considered as a separate religion. Now, we will go into that concept also. Like, what is the real meaning of dharma? What is the real meaning of religion? Is Buddhism and Jainism offshoot of Hinduism? Or it's a different religion? I mean, these are different dialogues we will get into. So, let's take some time later for this. 
Okay. Almost ready to share the poll. About 70 people have filled it out. 60%, please. Do that. Let's see what other questions you want to take. It's kind of more on the board. Uh, there's a question. I was about to ask the same. Is this conflicting with other dharma class? If yes, can one can be changed? Um, I okay. Can the question be a little more specific? I will answer. See, uh, the question which says, I was about to ask the same. Is this conflicting with the other dharma? Class, if yes, one of them we change. Uh, I didn't get what. Are, are, are you getting messages direct or something? Um, because we have the QA box where it's a little bit different, and then we have the chat box where people are probably sending you messages. Oh, and we have the webinar poll, which is uh, separate. I'll open well. the QA then. Once yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And if you uh, want to talk about the specific book that we're going to use or some of the texts. Yes, yes. Uh, there is this book by M. Hiriyanna. M. Dot Hiriyanna. H-I-R-I-Y-E-N-N-A. This is a writer. The book's name is The Essentials of Indian Philosophy. The name of the book is The Essentials of Indian Philosophy. Now, this is a very um, compact and a small book. Very big. It gives a nice explanation as an, at an introductory level. Uh, later on, as the course begins, I would also uh, give the other reference material and other names of the books. And uh, you can... I mean, take the references from those books also. So I would be in all taking four to five books into consideration. Um, Surendranath Das Gupta is one of them. Dr. Radha Krishnan is one. Uh, and M. Hiryana also has another book. Uh, plus, if you can get in, get to the Encyclopedia of Indian Philosophy, that is also a very good source to understand Shaddarshanas at the initial level. Uh, of course, uh, as I put the details about weekly course uh, distribution, I would be giving you the readings also. Okay. is not opening here that's probably just a tab i'll just read i mean there's quite a few questions i don't know if um <laughs> yeah, sure that um okay yeah i got one here yes which version you are following <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so you can see this yeah and so um as you answer them i'll just take them off the board if you want to not answer them no, that's okay. Uh, well, um, as a student of philosophy, uh, uh, I don't believe in following any one darshan. Uh, we have to be open because that's the philosophy of darshans. So we have to be open, try to find out answers to our questions, respect all the darshans and pick up whatever we like and that suits our life. <laughs> I mean, so it's not about just sticking because sticking to one darshan limits us. Okay, then Acharu Akaloka at the Darshan is largely studied through the works of Vedantins. Are there independent works of the Chavas? Uh, not many actually. Uh, it is not found. Very few literature is available. Uh, but yes, as you say, we see that it we see them as Purva Paksha. Now, this is a concept which says Purva Paksha and Uttar Paksha. So, there is an argument put by uh, one darshan, and then the other darshan tries to uh, 
refute that. So while refuting, it has to be explained first. So from that context, we get most of the understanding of Charvak. Uh, can what is the what is the most popular darshan followed in Indian, or what is the ratio in which they are followed? Okay. Um, okay. Numerically, I'm sorry, I don't know about this, but uh, yes, Vedanta darshan is followed um, in its different forms. Uh, then in India, there is also Bhakti Sampradaya, which also believes in the Dvaita version of Vedanta Darshan, which is also largely followed. Uh, there are huge number of people following Jain Darshan, Bhakti Darshan, all over the world, also in India. So uh, we will have a wonderful discussion as the course begins that Hinduism is not different from or it's not a different religion from Buddhism or Jainism, but these are different perspectives. And it came up as a sampradaya. Buddhism, Jainism, they initially came up as different sampradayas, part of Hinduism. Later on, you know, the political and the other aspects, today it talks differently uh, as religion and things. I mean, there's a lot of colonization impact, then post-colonization also there are so many impacts, political impacts. So it's when any particular school becomes dogmatic, it isolates itself from the mainstream. At the same time, the mainstream also becomes dogmatic sometimes and it removes certain things from it. So this is all part of ignorance that floats around. But philosophically, uh, they all coexist. Okay, let me share the poll results. We had about 74 people. Well, I don't know if everyone can see that or can you see that? We had 74 people out, 40 people interested in taking the course. Good to hear. You can take a look at the course details. Again, I'm dropping them in the chat. Um, It, uh, 40 out of the 74 people have taken at least one course at HUA before. Nice to hear. About 26 people have questions before they want to enter on this course. Um, great. Thank you for filling that out. A um, couple questions on the Sikh version, if that follows into that, or it's more like a sum, not a sum for that, but its own view. And somebody also brought up Buddha again as a different avatar. Mm -hmm. Buddhism initially was is part of Hinduism. As a part of philosophy, um, it shares so many things with Hinduism. One or two things are differently put. Uh, but the origin of Sikhism was related to some invasions in India. Uh, and it was a reaction to that. And initially they started as soldiers, fighters, and it's part of Hinduism. That's what I say. Again, politically, it has all uh, taken different turns now. But philosophically, it's all same. same. I mean, they belong to same part of the land, civilization, culture. So philosophically, if something is different, that doesn't mean it is out of. It's Vasudeva Kutumbakam is the philosophy of Hinduism, wherein it's all family. So there are people in family who are a little different from each other. That doesn't mean they're out of family. So Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, this is part of Hindu family. Politically now, it gets different colors. Okay, uh, any closing thoughts? Before we uh, end the session, we'll send you the details afterwards and uh, we hope you will in, enroll in this course. Again, I'm dropping the chat, uh, the links in the chat, and we'll follow up. Thank you for joining us. It's always my pleasure to host these. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. 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 Sachin, for uh, joining us and um, sharing your wisdom. Uh, I mean, that is good. Thank you for that. And I want to thank you and HUA for uh, giving me this opportunity to share thoughts on Indian philosophy. 
And to all the participants, I would say, uh, take this as an opportunity to go into uh, the understanding of what is the basis of Hinduism or Hindu, uh, I mean, try to understand the philosophical basis of our life and of our um, thought process. Take this as an opportunity and it, I'm sure you'll be happy to learn this. All right, great. Thank you. Namaste. Danyavad. Namaste. Danyavad. See you all.